one. All right. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and I am here to, tonight with uh, my good friend, uh, Joe Lansdale. Welcome, Joe. It's great to have you. Always Thank great you. to I'm see you. I'm glad to be here. In these yeah, a little different circumstances, but it's fine. Yeah, we'll get into that. Hey, just as kind of, I always like to try to give a formal introduction, and at, by way of doing that tonight, I'm going to steal Kathleen Kent's, a bit of her intro uh, to this new, terrific new collection of Mice and Minestrone. Um, but Kathleen, if you've never read her, by the way, terrific, terrific writer. Uh, he is one of my favorite crime writers of all time. Absolutely. And her historical novels are damn good, too. You're very good. The Outcast. Yeah. Is that the one that's set in Texas in the 1870s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we go. Uh, Western writer J. Frank Doby said at the beginning of his novel, Coronado's Children, these tales are not creations of mine. They belong to the soil and to the people of the soil. Joe Lansdale, one of the most prolific and natural, natural born storytellers I've ever known, seems to summon up his far ranging narratives, not so much from the heady ether of the literary muses, but from the Martian red dirt of East Texas. Uh, he's written at least 45 novels, 30 short story collections, many chapbooks and comic book adaptations. But while I've spent several weeks reading this newest collection of early Happen Leonard stories, of Mice and Minestrone, there's a good chance he's published even more. That's probably true. <laughs> uh, some of Joe's yeah. awards include 10 Bram Stoker Awards, a British Fantasy Award, an Edgar Award for the Bottoms, and a World Horror Convention Grand Master Award. There are many other awards, both national and international. He's been inducted into the Texas Literary Hall of Fame, and several of his novels and short stories have been adapted to film, including uh, Bubba Hotep and Cold in July and others. Um, but the re I, I just wanted to steal that because it's a really wonderful uh, thought, you know, thought-provoking intro. And, uh, yeah, I was very, uh, I was very, uh, I guess what you'd say, humbled by that very nice <laughs> intro that Kathleen wrote. Well, it's funny because she mentioned Frank Doby, um, who I love, and I think that um, you and I, for many years now, have exchanged obscure, you know, favorite novels and Western history recommendations. Have you ever come across Doby's book, um, uh, Vaqueros of the Brush Country? You know what? I don't own it, but I have read it from the library many years ago. Wow, what a great uh, But I, I, can, I also have one about a Texan in London. Have you ever seen that one? No. No, I haven't. You wrote a book. I found one signed. Uh, Is that right? You know, in a rare book store, yeah, and it was, it was signed to somebody, but I bought it anyway. I said, I got to have this. It's a uh, history. There's also a new um, Steve Davis put together a collection, a brand new one of is better writings and, and uh, it's something that you probably should get. I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's uh, I think it's just J. Frank Doby. I mean, mm -hmm. Steve Davis of uh, the University of Texas University, which has all my stuff. They keep all my manuscripts. Right. Paul Wellman is another one I've become interested in in the yeah. last few years. Very interesting guy. Wasn't he Manly Wade Wellman's brother? I don't know. Was he? I hadn't heard that. I think he was. I believe he was. I could be wrong. I could have that mixed up or something, but I believe he was. Wrote the, he wrote well. Yeah, the Comancheros and uh, Bronco Apache and all kinds of interesting stuff. Yeah, I haven't read that one, but I, I know of it. Right. Um, well, uh, we're actually going to be talking about a couple of your new books today. Uh, I mentioned this uh, collection of early Happen Leonard stories of Mice and Minestrone. Wonderful collection. Um, you've done. Thank you. Is this, is this the third you've done? In, in that kind of vein, or maybe the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at least three or four, I don't know. <laughs> at least three, and I think the other, I think a couple of them have been recollected and, and put together in another book. There's a there's a really cool publisher called SSP Publishing that does limited editions of these, and they do illustrations and things like that. And then Tachyon's just this wonderful little house that is doing these books, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that they are, and this one is doing quite well for them. Yeah, um, and it also has some uh, some recipes that I understand Casey yeah. put, Casey put together. <laughs> That's right. She did some videos for them. And, I saw uh, that. If you would go on the, and well, she did four of them, and they're very funny. If you go on the Tachyon website, 
Uh, she does the cooking, and uh, but as she calls us, you know, Casey's Kitchen, two words she never would thought would fit together. <laughs> <laughs> nor nor would I, but uh, she actually does the recipes and it's great fun. And is Dr. Pepper and vanilla ice cream or vanilla cookies feature into any of the recipes? Not that she does um, uh, banana pudding, I think, if I remember right. I, I, it's been a while since I've heard them. I know that was one of them that uh, was on the list, and I, I, I do remember um, that she did half the chili, you know, and she did half's eggs. And some stuff like that. So they were, they were all a lot of fun. Oh, and scones. She did Trudy's scones. And, and, I, and I, I was thinking the other one might have been, uh, might have been, uh, I can't remember. Now, are you and Casey, have you collaborated on any more uh, of the Dana Roberts case book kind yes. of stories? Those were We really have another one that yeah, we sold to an anthology that I, I won't talk about too much, but I'll just say that it's coming out pretty soon and we're pretty happy with it. And I hope for us to do some more. And uh, we have some other projects in film and books come along. And my son and I uh, have, he has a movie coming out next month that he co-wrote and it stars some of the Happen Leonard alumni. Really? Like Bill Sage, yeah, and Pat Healy. And the, the, one of the guys, and I'm really embarrassed, I can't remember from uh, 13 Reasons Why, uh, mm -hmm. He's in it, and uh, it's a weird western. They filmed it in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and uh, keeps a writer on the script. And so I think it might be a lot of fun. I'm, 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 the script was good, and I was there for some of the filming, and I had a lot of fun watching it. So I have a feeling it might be great. Your kids are very, very talented. You know, they take after the old yeah, man. Good. Yeah. Ah, well, they put me to shame. <laughs> um, well, I want also to talk about. Uh, your brand new novel that's just come out called More Better Deals, a uh, wonderful, yep. wonderful standalone book. And I remember um, last year when you were here in person, you were describing the concept to me. And uh, boy, it has all the Lansdale elements you've come to love. Uh, can you kind of give the, the basic setup? Yeah. Well, you know, what I first started to do is I, I wanted to do something that was a little more traditional or at least harken back to the traditional. And James Kane and, and uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald were in my mind. It's actually both of them. People would say, F. Scott Fitzgerald, what are you talking about? But the whole idea is very much a James Kane sort of story. But it, it, it has that whole, I like to think, the things that, if you like my work, the humor, the darkness, uh, and I think the style is very much mine. And I believe it's an exciting book, and I think there are like two or three scenes in it that you'll uh, be aghast with happiness. <laughs> you know, you go, oh my God, oh, that's still, that's cool. That's what I'm hoping. And uh, I always said that when I write stories, it's not the guy that wants to rob Fort Knox that interests me. It's the guy that wants to rob the beauty parlor down the street because he knows there's $300 in the till. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that interests me more than the big, you know, the big capers and things like that. And uh, so I, I saw this, and, and I'll say this in such a way not to, to hurt the book, but the idea that here's a guy that his idea of the big time is having a drive-in theater, a hot babe, and a pet cemetery. And he's trying to make, build his life around that and have a career so he doesn't have to be a used car salesman. And uh, to me, just one one damn thing leads to another. But it's there's a deadly earnestness about the main character Ed. I mean, he's really serious, and he's like Gatsby, who walks out on the pier, and you remember, and reaches for the green light, and he and he's reaching for that green light. Well, Ed's reaching for that that damn drive-in sign, that that big rocket or whatever that's sticking up in the dark, you know, right. and, and glowing. And that's what he wants, and, and I, I kind of thought that uh, there was a little bit of that Gatsby aspect to it, is that there's that hole that he can never fill, but right now it looks like a drive-in theater and a, and a pet cemetery, and this uh, tracky woman might be just, just the thing, you know? Yeah, it's funny because a Cadillac, you know, for, for you know, men and women of that generation, and, and later, you know, that was a symbol of success. Yeah. You had a caddy. It was very much so. Yeah. And you know what? I'll tell you what's more interesting. It was a symbol of success for poor people, especially. You'd have people that couldn't afford anything else, and they would buy that car because it was not only a symbol of success, 
it, it gave you mobility. It didn't tie you to the farm. Right. You know, it didn't tie you to this one little area. You could get in that Cadillac and uh, lean back, let your hand rest on that wheel, and away you go. Yep. So the Cadillac represents a lot, and a red one represents even more. Mm. And uh, so for me, you know, there's a lot of those symbolic elements that I wanted to put into this novel that I wanted to enjoy, uh, you know, kind of rehashing. But also, I, I thought that it really applied to things now. It'll, it'll probably apply to things 20 years from now. It's that, it's those little dreams. It's the American dream skewered. That's exactly what and I, I should have kind of asked you this before we got started, but should should yeah. we talk about the character's kind of, I don't know if you call it a secret, but uh, you allude to it kind of. Um, I don't know. You know would you, you rather not? not? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't have a, I don't have an opinion on it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, well, th there is something, you know, yeah. There's something that might affect uh, the way he views the possibility yeah, of, of, very, very much. of the American dream being available to him. And, uh, well, yeah, and, and uh, um, it's it's probably not a big, big surprise, yeah. and we probably could discuss it, I guess, you know. But but what I'll say at first is just that there are a lot of things that makes him desire this American dream that's uh, perhaps a little bit different than the average person. And also, you know, Ed's he's a little bit more skewered. He's not thinking I'll do some hard work and, and build my way up and buy my own drive-in theater and all. He's looking for that easy, that easy fix, that easy route. Right. And uh, he's also looking for the, for the lady who has some ideas that may not be the most scrupulous, but you know, and he's, and he's not down with it at first, but you know, you know, that here's a guy that he's on the train to, to, you know, oblivion almost. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but it's I always think that these stories aren't about where they're going because I, they're about the journey they're about the trip it's about how it takes you there it's like when I wrote Jane goes north my whole idea was the trip is the thing not the destination right and I think life's like that. it really is about the trip because you got all these people who are always looking for that big moment they're going to have and they look up and they're 70 years old and they're going, well, when's my big moment coming? It's probably already come. <laughs> and it was probably already there and you didn't enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Or you just were sidetracked by looking for that big moment. Well, that's, and that's, all of, that's, that's a lot of what the book's about. Well, also, I mean, actually, a lot of your books have that element to it. I think about The, yeah. edge, the edge of Dark Water, you know, that classic river, river story, you know, lighting out for the territories. Yeah, the, and the artery of the world, you know, it, it's that, uh, and, and in many ways, it's the um, Odyssey, and it's the Jason and the Argonauts, you know, you have all of, all of these things you're trying to do, and something always gets in your way, there's always the Cyclops, or there's a point, and you know, in Edge of Dark Water, there literally was a Cyclops, Even if people pay attention, there's a guy with one eye that becomes representational of the Cyclops. And, Interesting. And so there's a lot of that sort of stuff that I have fun with, and if other people get it, great. And if they don't, that's okay. And I say that to say that there's a lot of that in this book. There are a lot of, you know, I don't want to sound like those things when we went to school and uh, they teach the Scarlet Letter and the, you know, the, the, the tree limb stands for this, and it's not like that. But there's a lot of things there that I think sort of dig into um, that American dream as it was um, maybe first conceived but yet skewered by a variety of different people in a lot of different ways. I mean, certain gangsters, they, they were after the American dream, sure. but they were after it in a different ways than most of it. I mean, I got the American dream. I'm one of those that feel like I got it right. and I've had it for years. Now, um, this is really interesting because we're, we get into sort of the direction I wanted to go in, which was you know, kind of, yeah. as you find yourself as a writer and just as a human being, um, you know, as you said, you're you're not 70 yet, but you've lived a little bit now. And um, and as you look back, um, this this sort of reckoning with your past, or and also a reckoning with this country's past, and and kind of mm -hmm. the the story it likes to sell itself. We like to sell ourselves about about yeah. us, and you know where we were and. This whole notion of the good old days, um, 
Yeah. And a lot of these things are very, very timely right now and very important things to kind of look at. They again. are. Yeah. Um, any yeah, any you know comments? The, uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to say nostalgia is one of those tricky things because there's a lot of great moments of, of reliving a nostalgia, and that's fine. But what a lot of people don't know is that usually they were about 12 years old when they were when they're thinking back it's that time when they didn't have to pay bills they didn't have to worry about what was next uh and if you were white and uh maple it was a whole lot easier and so when you go back to those times for other people it may not have been so glorious it may have been simpler in some ways but there's always a payoff you know there's always something that you that there's something that's not quite right but you're always striving for something more. I'm a big believer in the American dream. I just don't think it's been available to everybody. Yeah. And so the concept, I believe in, and I think the reality is there, but you gotta be able to give everybody that same chance. Right. Uh, now, the the, uh, the new book uh, takes place in, I think, is it 66, 1966? Um, I think 62. Is it 62? I think so. You might be more correct than me, though. You know? Well, I, I don't remember. My cue, I moved on. My, my cue is that he refers to uh, a 62 Cadillac as being a couple of years old. So I thought okay, it would have been... Old. Okay. Can you talk... And it's, yeah. set, it's set in your, you know, your, your neighborhood, your, your patch, which is East Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so much in the country obviously was changing at that time in the mid-60s or was about to change. Civil rights yes, movement. Yes, there was coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vietnam is starting to heat up. Uh, did did yes. it did it make its way these kind of cultural shifts into East Texas, or was it? Were you oh, yeah. behind the times? These, but not, not in the same way. I mean, the cultural shifts were the bigger moments, like the John F. Kennedy assassination. That was a that was a big thing. That's the first thing I remember being just uh, astounding and outside of what we considered the norm. And then when you have to that, of course, you know, already you had Elvis who had come, and that changed things, too, in its own way. And then you had the assassination of Kennedy, and then you had the Beatles. You know, those things were there, but the thing is, is that in East Texas in the 50s and the 60s, it wasn't a whole lot different than the 30s, or the maybe the 40s at best, because things trickled very slowly. It wasn't up until the 80s that things began to snap and catch up. Because really? for a long time, you know, if you were in East Texas, you were anywhere from... 10 to 20 years behind in the way things look, in the way people dress, the way they talk. There were exceptions. You know, I had long hair in the 60s, uh, probably the late 60s mostly. I was, and, and, but there were a lot of people that were starting to. So it was starting to change then, but it would change in stutters. And now the world changed every six months. It used to be about every 10 years, you know, there'd be some echo of change. And in East Texas, it used to be more like about every 20 years. Right. And of course, uh, you know, a, a major element of all of your work from the very beginning really is, is racism and, you know, race relations. Yes. And so I'm assuming that it needs right. to... And I, I think we can say something about the, the book. I don't think it hurts the book. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's in some of the reviews and things like that. So I don't... And, and that is that Ed is uh, biracial and yet he can pass. And that was a big thing when I was growing up in the, in the South, if you had people who could pass, then they could live a better life, and their whole life would be different because they, if they were noted to have one drop of black blood, then they were no longer able to do the things that they would be able to do just by walking across the street. And, you know, this side, on this end would be, you know, the black section of town, on this end the white section of town, but a person who could pass could actually find the American dream or at least want to achieve it, where if they just perceived that you were black, you were, you were pushed down. And I grew up poor, and I had to struggle for the American dream, but it was easier for me because my skin was white. And I think somebody that maybe had the same uh, condition or position financially and they were black, that they would have had a harder time achieving just what I had. Right, now you're, uh, some of the people that have been to the store and have, have seen the events know about my fascination with your father who is this uh, yeah. real larger than life, uh, in, at least in my mind. Yeah. And you've written, you've written a lot about him. Yeah. I'm fascinated with him too. And he just, you know, we know that, that you're, a, you know, you're a badass, uh, but you said that he was the strongest guy you've ever known. And can you talk a little bit about him? 
Yeah, my dad, he was a big man, you know, he was, uh, but he was a hardworking man. He grew up, um, you know, he was born in 1909. He grew up in a time when people didn't send kids to school much in the area because they put them on the farm and put them to work. He, he grew up in a sharecropping family. He never had one day of school. His mother died when he was eight. He was illiterate. He had learned to write his name. And I think towards when he got in his 50s, he kind of dope out a comic book or a newspaper a little bit. But, you know, I helped him uh, read some. My mother did. But for all practical purposes, he was illiterate. But he was the most, um, I guess, confident person I ever knew. You know, he wasn't scared of anything or anybody. At least if he was, he did not show it. And he was someone that, you know, he dug ditches. He, he, did, he would catch... Uh, uh, the train and ride the rails to different fairs where they had boxing and wrestling and he would do that for money and then he worked in cannon factories and finally my mother bought him an old car and said you want to be a mechanic right he said, yeah she said will you take that car apart and put it back together so you can do it blindfold and that's how my father developed his career thanks to my mother who uh, bought him that car and, and he just worked on that car so he could do it and he was a mechanic his entire life after and, and he worked for himself the largest part of it. And certainly from the time when I first was growing up, he worked for a place called Wanda Petroleum in Mount Enterprise. And then when we moved to Gladewater, he gradually started his own business, first under a shade tree, you know, the old shade tree mechanic tree. And then after he had been doing that for a while, he was able to rent a garage and he stayed there until he retired, until he retired. Wow, and so when you were a kid, I know you've told some really fantastic stories about kind of hanging out there as a young yes. young man reading comic books and um, yep. there, there was that one story I don't know if you can if you can I've asked you to tell it like five times but I don't think people online may have heard it it's such uh, a wonderful story just, do you have a shortened I'm version assuming, of it yeah I'll try to do my best uh, my father worked on a car for a lady is this the one you're talking yeah. about yeah oh, yeah yeah or the dog one I didn't know which one but my, my father had worked on a car for a lady, and uh, when he was finished with it, one day I came up there to go to lunch with him, and uh, a guy showed up, and he was a young man. My dad was, uh, you know, he was pretty old then, because he was 40-something when I was born, and I was 17 at this time, so, you know, he was getting in uh, later years, especially for that era, and, uh, you know, he'd gotten a little old and all that, but he was still this extraordinarily strong person. But this guy was, uh, I always called him in the story I wrote about him, called him Apollo Red, because that's the way I ever remembered him. He, he was this real handsome guy with a wavy kind of uh, Jerry Lee Lewis hair, you know. And he came in and said, well, I've come to pick up my girlfriend's car, whatever her name was. And my dad said, well, I'm going to have to get half the money for it, because she didn't pay me for the last one. And the guy says, no, I, we got to have it. And he said, well, how are you going to drive two cars? He said, well, I'm going to get it out. And I'm going to park it over there so that when she gets off work, I can pick it up. Meaning, of course, it would not be in the garage. And my dad said, no, we're not going to do that. It ain't going to happen. Said, oh, that's not funny. And this guy started being kind of belligerent. And then he, you know, just started to take a swing at my dad. And I'm, I'm curtailing this a little bit. And my dad just jumped in and hit him harder than I've ever seen any human being ever hit. And it actually literally did what I didn't know could happen. It picked him off the ground and set him on the uh, fender of his car. And he rolled over the hood. The hood armament caught his shirt and ripped it, you know, off. And this guy's laying on the ground and his eyes are twitching and his legs twitching. And I'm going, oh, my God. I thought he had broken you know, his brain or something, knocked his brain out or, you know, dislocated his brain stem. Because, I mean, the guy literally, and he was a much bigger man than my father. And uh, so the guy just lay there, and finally he just quit moving. And I said, Daddy, you, you killed him. And he came over and he looked at him, and he had this little cigar. I always remember that. I, I remember see that to this day. He reached in, I got that little stove the cigar out. And then he fished around, got that little box of matches, and pushed it out. Got a match out, and he lit up. And he kind of flipped it over. He looked down, and he said, Nah, he didn't come around. And uh, a little bit later, I'm sitting there. We're, you know, reading the comic book. We were supposed to go to lunch, but this guy's partly laying in our driveway. And after a little with his car parked there, and after a little bit, I, I begin to think it isn't going to happen. And the guy twitched a little bit, and, and then he tried to get up. He rolled over. He finally got to his feet. And uh, when he started wandering off, he would, it was just like this. He, did, he forgot he brought a car. He just wandered off. 
down behind the filling station over across and, and down. And about two hours later, we went and got something to eat, brought it up there, and, and the, the, these cops showed up. Uh, you know, in a, in a cop car, two of them, and one was a little younger, and one my dad knew a little, I think. And uh, they they said, well, Bud, well, they they said that you uh, man came by and his girlfriend called us, and they said that you hit him so hard that you really, really hurt him. He said, we, we, is that true? He said, yeah, just as hard as I could. <laughs> and the cop said, well, man, we're going to have to take you in. And my dad said, nah, I don't think so. And they said, well, um, no, I mean, we, we got to bring in. He said, nah, I'm not going. And they were just like, and the, and the younger guy started to get out of the car, and uh, the, the older guy just reached over and said, I get the car. The guy, and they closed the door, and they drove off. We never heard from them again or whatever. And when we got up, when, when he came back the next morning, that guy's car was gone. And then the, they later came back, uh, not that guy, but the lady came and finally paid him to get the car out. But, uh, you know, my dad was really quite reasonable with people because he was poor too. He knew how hard it was. But this, this, this was an unreasonable moment on that guy's part that I'm sure to this very day, if he, if he's not, you know, sorting socks somewhere, and that's his his life, um, probably wishes he hadn't done that. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that you, you know, you're very uh, upfront about is that you know your father. Had, you know, came with the racial attitudes of the day. Yeah. You know, he wasn't you know, he yeah. wasn't a saint. He inherited those viewpoints. No, no one But at, at his heart, he was he was a good person. And, uh, and there's a, a decent person, a good man. And there's a, a, a particular story that uh, was used really well in the Happen Leonard TV series as a flashback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Can you talk about yeah, that? They, they combined a couple of things, and of course they did a little bit of an ending. Yeah, what, my dad was just he had horrible racist rhetoric. I mean, it was extremely painful to me. And, uh, you know, he would get really mad if I corrected him or whatever. But And this is just one of many examples. But I remember one night we had driven to Gladewater to visit some relatives, and it came out an incredible storm. I mean, and, and it was, I've said this before too, it was the first time with that car going along and rocking, that I realized there was something more powerful than my old man. <laughs> it was the wind and the rain and the lightning, but he'd probably be second to that as far as I was concerned. And we're driving along and there was a, a black family that their car had broke down the side of the road. And I'm a kid, I'm, I'm young. I heard my dad say all this stuff and there are people driving by yelling epithets at, at this, this couple and, and their family and and my dad pulled over behind the car and uh you know he got his tools after he was a mechanic he always carried his tools with him got him out of the trunk he went over and he talked to the man who had the hood up the black man that was under the hood and then after a little while my father got under the car and there's water running and just you know pools and stuff and just raining unbelievably and he's under there for a long time and he finally gets that car fixed because this guy obviously didn't know you know what was going on and he, he he comes back and he gets in the car and he starts up and i kind of looked at him because i thought you know i'm hearing all this rhetoric from him and my dad he said well he, he's got those kids with him you know he tried to find a way to nullify that but i saw him do things like that many times one time i went down to the garage and this was back when five dollars was really five dollars you could and there were a bunch of little black kids standing around my dad and he's giving them five dollar bills which we could not really afford i mean i bet he gave four or five you know it's 20 25 dollars which would be like 250 500 dollars now in a way you know because five dollars you had a five dollar bill in your pocket that was a big big thing and i said daddy what are you doing he said those kids are hungry my father had been hungry you know he had been very hungry and he'd lived through the great depression and worked through the great depression and fed two and three families from his own hard work when other people couldn't even get jobs. So he knew what it was like not to have something to do. And I never forgot those two things in particular. And I curtailed those a little bit for our yeah. meeting here. Now he was he would, would have been too uh, too old for the war, right? For World War II? Well, what happened, yeah, he was too old for the war, but he also had a double, well, he had a hernia. And, um, you know, you know, tell this on TV, but he didn't have it fixed at first, so he would just get up in the morning and punch it up in, at, inside him, and wrap it with a cloth and pull it up tight and go to work. Jesus. And he tried to join the military. 
they would go, uh, no. And so he finally got all that fixed when he felt he could afford it a few years later. But he would do that, and you would actually, he'd actually push it up inside of it, you know. And I, I was just like, oh, God. And, and, and people were, I think, a little tougher back then in those, in that, you know, way. Yep. But that was still, and you know, it wasn't like he was showing out. He wasn't making nothing of it. That's what he did. Mm. You know, I remember one time he got his finger cut somehow. I don't know what it was, but it was cut deep. And, uh, you know, and we, they just didn't go to the doctor much then. And he, he put uh, axle grease on, on, the, on the cut to stop the bleed, which he did. And then he came home and he got a, a sewing machine needle. Oh, one of the big old Singer sewing machine needle. Got fishing line, ran that thing through it, and sewed his hand up without any kind of anesthesia. But, and you know, it was so intense for me, I had to leave the room. But he sewed it up, and it got you know it healed, and he went back to work. You know, he went back to work the next day. How he did it, I don't know. But you know, he could not work. It wasn't a matter of like I think I'll take a vacation. Or I'll take a couple of days off, or I've got money in reserve. None of that was an option. Boy, you hear, and he had grown up working hard his whole life. You hear stories like that, and you think, boy, we are so soft now, aren't we? Oh, we. <laughs> now, my kids think I'm tough. You now they'll say, God, Dad, how do you do that? That's just tough. I said, Man, I tell you, I'm not tough at all. You ought to, you know, your grandpa. That was the toughest man I ever saw in my life. But I did see there were a lot of people like that at least to some degree back then because in some ways they had to be you know they didn't have access to any medical care much um you know with insurance was that was what's that you know there was not, nobody was buying insurance because they couldn't afford it so it didn't even occur you know my father's truck got hit with a train and and he survived it and they put him in the hospital and he didn't even know you know he didn't have any insurance and they paid it out over a period of time before he died you know, and you could pay it out back then because it wasn't as expensive. Right. So in some you didn't ways, you have thirty guys come in and like put a band aid on you, and another one come in and, and clean the wound, put the band aid on you, and everybody gets paid separate. You had a doctor. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> wow. So in some ways, this new uh, the new novel here, more better deals. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's sort of a nod to. Uh, to, to that generation, although your father would have been in his 50s by then, correct? Yeah, and yeah, you, he would have been. He yeah, would have been a teenager. Was, uh, yeah, yeah, he would have been. He, um, the, the thing is, it's a nod to that that generation that's supposedly the simpler time, which it really wasn't. But it's also the beginning of change in the United States because it's after World War II, and that's when the American dream idea cranked up mm. because all these people came home and from the war, and how are you going to keep them on the farm anymore, as they used to say, because they had seen gay pari or whatever. Right. And so a lot of these, they had the, uh, you know, they had a GI loan. They bought houses, or they could, could at least now afford houses because the economy was booming, you know, for most people. It didn't boom too much for us, but there was a little bang there when I was growing up for about, probably about the first four or five years. And we had a pretty nice house and, and uh, uh, you know, a few things that were, that we never had again after four or five years. We never had them again. Detroit, we never Detroit was in its heyday too, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Cars were, were the big thing. And cars were, you'd probably get one for a couple thousand dollars, get a used one for, you know, a thousand dollars or four hundred dollars. And, and I mean, you know, a few years old. But you buy a brand new car for a couple thousand dollars, buy a house for four or five in East Texas buy a whole house and uh, I remember when Karen and I were married we kept wanting to buy land and we couldn't afford we wanted to buy 100 acres and we could have bought 100 acres for like uh, I think it was like $100 an acre and um, and when my dad and him were going it was like a dollar an acre 50 cents an acre so $100 an acre was the same but it was just as hard for Karen and I to get <laughs> to get $100 an acre to buy 10 or 20 acres. I mean, now we have that now, but we didn't pay $100 an acre for it either. Okay. But we just didn't have it, you know, and we had to, we worked our way up and times are just different. The idea of poor now is even different. You know, you know, I, I, poor people can afford a cell phone now and uh, they can afford things that they couldn't, you know, they wouldn't even have dreamed of because it didn't exist back then. 
But you know, you're pretty much uh, the big big deal is you go buy a block of ice and and take it home and put it in the sink and chip it up and we have lemonade and a watermelon. <laughs> that was a party. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's funny because the new book, um, it, you, you mentioned James M. Cain and that sort of classic yeah. classic setup. It reminded me a little bit of Jim Thompson too. You know, sort of bit of bit of Thompson yeah, thrown in there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that, you know I, I I mixed on Thompson. What I like, I really like. I've written introductions to a couple of them, but what I don't like, I really don't like. And right? I, I like Kane across the board pretty much. Although I think his best novels were the, the two that everyone knows him for: Postman and Double Indemnity. Um, you know, those to me were were his classic things. But I think the reason that there's a similarity to Thompson is that we grew up in similar areas. He was older than I. But again, what I was talking about, things didn't change that quick. Mm. And he grew up in a more, um, he grew up in rural Texas like me, I think, too. But he grew up in oil fields and oil patches and things like that. And I think West Texas, and I'm in East Texas, which is different. But I think you can't help but echo those things. And when I, I remember when I first read Flannery O'Connor, I went, "Them was my peeps. You know, I know, who, I know who she's writing about. I know those people. Yeah. Um, well, as we mentioned, this is, mid 60s and this kind of is an interesting i want to really get into happen leonard here too uh because this sure. is a very transitional point here um and i mentioned on email to you earlier today about just how much i admire the uh the short stories in this new book of mice and minestrone right. but in particular this book uh, or this story the sabine was high and we meet hap just as he's getting out of prison and leonard just as he's getting home from vietnam and it's a really important intersection of time and over the series you know all of us uh you know happen leonard diehards you know you've sort of doled out bits and pieces of their history um can you talk about what inspired this story well there's a number of things i was a vietnam war resistor and uh i i've, I've told the story before but I, I dropped out of the university to be drafted to make my protest because i was young and i was uh, idealistic you know and sure enough, I got drafted and I went in and of course I passed all the physicals and you know, they gave you the little mental test, which is whatever it is. And uh, they said, well, you know, um, we're, we're going to um, have you uh, uh, inducted and we'll, we'll start your, your, your trip into the army, so to speak. And I said, well, I'm not going. And they said, what do you mean you're not going? You have to go. And I said, no, I don't believe in this war. I said, I think this war is wrong. And they said, you're a conscience objector. I said, no, I can't sign a conscience objector because the paper you showed me said I have to be against, like I wouldn't have fought World War II or I wouldn't protect myself. And I said, I can't in honesty, honesty check those boxes because I would have fought in World War II and I would protect myself. And there might be a future war in which I would say, yeah, I, I have to agree with this. but." I don't believe in this one. I don't see that this is going anywhere, you know, kind of thing. And, they, and of course, you know, that didn't thrill them. And um, they sent me over to be inducted and everybody was inducted but me. And I, I just said, no, I'm not. But what was odd is they sent me home for two weeks, I think it was, a week or two weeks. And they said, get everything in order, which, you know, pretty much was just holding a couple of pair of socks for me. I didn't have any. And so I went home for a couple of weeks. And then what you did, you would go to Tyler and catch the bus to Dallas. And you got like a free sack lunch. I, I remember that. And when you go in, I, I went in and I thought, well, this is it. I'm going to prison. Because if I didn't go, that's, that was the alternative. I didn't know how they did it or, you know, if I lo they loaded me up then or if I reported somewhere later, I had no idea. And uh, I had a few dollars in my pocket. I had on what I had on. And uh, I told them, no, I'm still not. I didn't change my beliefs from the last time I saw it. And they said, all right, go in and see, see our psychiatrist. So I did. And uh, they gave me a one Y and sent me home. And I, I rode the bus home, and I've been baffled to this day. But I think they threw me a bone because it was beginning to be that time when the war was turning. The, the favoritism toward it had certainly already worn out, and they were starting to wrap it up. And I think, too, because I wouldn't go to Canada and I uh, wouldn't sign as a conscience objector, and I didn't run from them, I think they said, you know what, let him go. And so Hap kind of has that except for the fact that he gets the other end of the stick. He has to go to prison. 
and he ends up going in the TV show. They call him a conscience objector, but he but he isn't in the book. And so he ended up going. And then Leonard, who really wanted to fight for his country and wanted to show his mettle, you know, and prove himself. And there's a lot going on with Leonard too that's more unspoken. But Leonard ends up going to Vietnam, and they both have certain experiences that I guess have scarred them, or certainly that they remember. And so when they meet in this story after so many years, it's like two brothers getting together. And my brother, by the way, went to Vietnam. Was, he was already in the military. He retired as a captain. He was in Vietnam. I think I think he served. I think he ended up going three terms because uh, because he was supposed to be two. I think. And I think because he was in. Uh, uh, they, it's not. It's, it wasn't called that then. Military intelligence. I think was. And so he ended up being there for a long time, you know, or for, well, more tours. And we really stayed in Thailand most of the time. But, you know, we had different views on it. And uh, we still talk about it once in a while, a little. But, uh, you know, I always look at it in Vietnam, here it is, and the communists mostly took it over, and they're the more, one of the most capitalist countries in Asia. And uh, it's one of our places where people go on vacations now from here, and people are moving there because people like it so much. And it's just so bizarre to think about roughly 54,000 people, soldiers, that were killed in this war that accomplished nothing, really, except for those soldiers that were brave and thought that they were doing the right thing, and I thought I was doing Yeah. So that's what was going on with Half of Limit. Right. And, um, you know, over this long-running series, you know, the, it's really, I don't want to define what the series is but one of the main elements that I get out of it are these are really books about friend you know friendship over a long period of time um, they're, they're, they're books about people that are different learning to settle their differences which is I think something that we need to learn right now I, 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 I see hope on that horizon but then again maybe I'm just being uh, falsely optimistic because I'm not a cynic I'm a, I'm a I'm a skeptic of about everything but on the whole I'm neither optimist or, or pessimist. I'm kind of a, a wounded realist, you know, or a progressive realist. You know, I, I'm, I hope things will go better, and I see signs of it. But if we don't learn to do that, then it's always going to be polarization, the Twitter warriors, you know, it's, it's just it's not going to go anywhere. We have, to, we have to work this out. We have to. And, we, you know, I think, I think we're constantly fed by political situations that – just enhance us. They, uh, they enhance the problem. I mean, they make us fearful, or they make us worried, or they, there's a malaise in the in the in the general air about what's going on in the world, no matter which side of it you are. Right. And uh, this whole virus, of course, you know, it's it's strange because I'm at home, and I'm I'm generally spend my time home a lot anyway as I work. But you know that things out there, and it's almost like you're. Uh, I am legend, and you're you're trapped in your house, and instead of the the vampires or zombies out there, it's this disease, and uh, it's it's moving around. You never know who's going to get it. You never know who's going to end up with it. So even if I'm comfortable, I fortunately uh, my career is in such a state that I'm I'm okay. I can be okay for a year or two probably, you know, and uh, you know life's good for me. But I know that's going on. And it keeps me maybe from connecting with people like I like to uh, for writing's sake. But strangely enough, I'm also gregarious when I need to be, and I'm absolutely not gregarious at all when I don't want to be. I can stay home. But this, but this disease is strange. You know, it, it gives everything a new flavor. So I try not to watch the news too much. I try to keep up with what's going on in reason. But I don't sit in front of it all the time because what they're going to tell me is there's a disease. I know that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, until we get that that control, you know, then it's going to be out there. And But it's created an entirely different climate, I think, for writers and for creators. Yeah, it's funny because it, I think like a lot of people out there, it's sort of had a, it's had a, a negative effect on my own mental stability, you know. Um, and I've had to really divorce myself a little bit and, and step back from that bombardment of news um, yeah. because as you say and I, you know we've talked I've talked to several other authors about this subject you know we've talked about you know agenda driven news which is strangling yeah. us you know on both sides yes, it is. 
You know, it's... You know, there's not news. There's very little news anymore because you have 24 hours. You have three major 24-hour channels that are trying to fill the air all the time. And, and the problem, even beyond agenda, is we need something for the next hour. So what you do is you have people tell you what's going on, then they tell you what's going to happen, and then they tell you if that happens, this is what's going to happen, and if it doesn't happen, this is going to happen. And they don't know that. And I, I do like you know some opinions of people that are in the know as far as like, what's this disease about? Mm. How's it spread? What's going on? But I don't need to hear every politician that you know ever walked the earth come in and give me their opinion because most of the time if they've got an r in front of their name or d in front of their name i know what their opinion is. right once in a while you'll get somebody that'll just come up and give you a straight honest thing and even people i don't agree with i appreciate that a hell of a lot more than all of this and it's all of it you know uh i mean i i tend to know which side i'm on but yeah. on the other hand I, I i just think people sit in front of this and they don't even realize that they're they're only getting 30 minutes of news a day, pretty much. And the rest of it is just, you know, revisiting that with different people and with slightly different tones. And then there's people coming on and telling you what's going on with the world and how this is happening and, and how, you know, the world's coming apart because people on, on uh, Twitter say you shouldn't wear a Hawaiian shirt because it offends Polynesians as if Polynesians are rising up in arms over... Hawaiian shirt. So you have this extreme political correctness mixed in with it from both sides. Right. There's different kinds of political. Totally. There's no way out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, do we have any questions from our Facebook we do. audience? Actually, we, Joe, we have a couple really nice comments, too. So this one I'd like to oh, share okay. with you. Um, so uh, Mike Langston says, read it today. More better deals. It's a winner. I always have a hard time describing the Lansdale style, but I recently read a review that I thought got it just about dead on. At the intersection where Mark Twain meets John Steinbeck in a diner run by James N. Kane, you will find writer Joe R. Lansdale's latest endeavor. More better deals, a touch profane, a bit profound, and all good. Uh, it was That was a really nice... Uh, reply i i'm sure you you hear a lot of really nice reviews how do you how do you prevent that from going to your head how do you uh well, you know what i do is i always enjoy them because i know that that's somebody's opinion but that's what it is it's somebody's opinion and i i you know great you know you're affecting people you want that but you know i always believe that whole creed that if you believe the good ones you got to believe the bad ones so i i enjoy the good ones and and uh but know that where they where they actually are they're, they're somebody's opinion i just get more good opinions than bad so i must be doing something right that's the way i look at it but as soon as you think you know something in this business you're you're through you're over with because you don't do anything different you don't expand you don't learn you don't challenge yourself and even if those challenges are unsuccessful i've always said i would rather have a um you know a i guess what you would say an interesting failure than a bland success <laughs> so, I, I just, I'll just keep trying, and, and I appreciate those kind of comments, of course. But no, I'm 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 too old. To let things go to my head. I, and, and you know, I had my success just built regular, like this. It was there was no like skyrocket when I was young, and I maybe I would have been dumber. I, I like to think I wouldn't have, but I might have. Mine's just been built one brick at a time, so I I, I have a more reasonable approach. To that. Well, I got to say, you have you know you have the most loyal and devoted fans just about any writer i know you know um, That's nice. um cindy uh, asks uh hey joe she says any new work featuring uh more stories with nat love which is a great question yes yes there um there is going to be uh, all i can say i, I don't want to jinx it because i'm not supposed to say much but all i would say is there's a novella forthcoming and uh, not long ago there was a novella called everything sparkles in hell and it was in an anthology from sub, I mean, a collection of mine from Subterranean. And weirdly enough, I don't remember the name of the collection anymore. <laughs> I've done too many. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really know. But there's, uh, there is a, uh, a new book coming out called Fishing for Dinosaurs. 
And though there's not a new Nat Love in it, there is a new Western sort of horror story in it called 68 Barrels on Treasure Lake. And there are uh, combinations of things that, you know, are sold out like Black Hat Jacks in it and uh, um, Prisoner 489 is in it. And a couple of other, and Fishing Dot for Dinosaurs, that story. And, and, and one other that I can't think of right now what it is, but it should be a really cool collection. It's called Fishing for Dinosaurs and it comes out at the end of this year. But, you know, that does have the, the Nat Love story in it that's already been out singularly. But watch for more Nat Love in the future. Um, you know, some of my favorite works of yours are the historicals, like, um, I mean, I think my all time favorite is Paradise Sky. I think that was. Is that right? If I had one of my books, that's it. You know, people always pick the bottoms, which I, I think, in some ways, I understand why that's the most popular, but Paradise Sky is, is my, my favorite. Well, I love the bottoms, too. I remember asking you at the time, because the bottoms was a real breakout book for you, in a sense. You know, it was yeah. won the Big Edgar Allan Poe Award. And I remember asking mm -hmm. you, you know, did you approach this novel any differently? And you go, nope. <laughs> nope, no. not really. <laughs> no, I didn't. No. It's the story I wanted to tell. You know, and sometimes people say, well, you told a kind of whimsical story that time, and all I can answer is, yep, I did. <laughs> and then you told a more serious story that time, yep. And, or you told Half and Leonard, which I think is somewhere in between those things. Like, what can I say, you know? I, if I get too conscious of doing anything, even if it's doing the whimsical, I'll ruin it. Mm. You know, I, I want to have fun. That's it. I, I, you know, I... I I selfishly became a writer for one reason only, and that was to have fun. Now, I realized that I might be able to make a living at it, but I originally thought I'd probably be a part-time writer and have to work for something else. And maybe eventually, when I could afford it, I might get a degree in anthropology or history and then write on the side. But things worked out better for me, thanks a lot to my wife for you know giving me those opportunities. But I went full time in '81. Um, my wife quit work in uh, in '88. Went to work for me, but uh, it's all I've ever wanted to do. And I, I got see, I've got the American dream, and I'm one of those that I, I I think how this is far more than I ever expected. This is great. I love this. This is great. If I never do any better, it can kind of stay right here, you know, until until I can't do no more. Then I won. Yeah. I won. Poor boy from East Texas. That's what I wanted. Because I don't measure it by money. I measure it by freedom, and the fact that I can, you know, I can afford what I need. I took care of our, our our family, and Karen took care of our family, and our kids grew up to be just fantastic, and they're doing fantastic. So that's all you can ask, you know. You get up every morning, and go. I love doing this. I love it. Well, and would you say that you're still hungry? Yes. Yes, but and hungry as far as a creative sense. That's not, what I. That's not, what I mean. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the right. Yeah, you know, and, and of course, you know, money's part of it. You got to pay your bills, and you you want money to be able to do interesting things and all that. But it's not my driving force. It's just one of those things that sometimes you have to pay attention to, you know. But fortunately, by doing what I want to do, 99% of the time, the results have been positive. And you know, film sales, foreign sales, all. Of it. Now, uh, so you mentioned 88, 89. That was roughly around the period um, when, well, let's see, Savage Season came out 89, 90, something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I always say that the year that turned for me was 86, though. It was okay. the Magic Wagon and uh, Dead in the West. So I had my mainstream and I had my uh, you know small press. And then a short story of mine called Tight Little Stitches in the Dead Man's it got quite a bit of attention. It was nominated for a World Fantasy Award. So it established my short story creds, my small press creds, and my you know larger press creds. And uh, there was some money coming in. And I was doing some anthologies, editing those. And all of a sudden, things started cooking. But in um, 1989, I think it was, uh, Cold in July came out, and 1990, Savage Season. And that was another jump, you know? And right. you have those in the bottom. Of, of, well, when I went to Mysterious Press and began to write books for them, that was a jump. And when I wrote uh, The Bottoms for them, that was another jump. Right. When I went to Kana, uh, and then an, uh, I think the next big jump for me was uh, probably when I went to Mulholland. Mm. I, I think I wrote some good things in between there, but the you know, noticeable change 
and I was also selling things to film and writing scripts and so you know it's been a good life so far <laughs> and we mentioned some of the the historicals like dark uh, paradise sky and uh, also I really love the thicket it's another favorite and I was supposed to film it in April and then we got sidelined by this virus by this I was supposed to direct a film this year and it got sidelined by really? this virus so yeah yeah but you know you got to be philosophical about stuff like that i mean yeah it, it happens you know you you hope that later on you get those opportunities that they film the thicket or i get to do that film i want to direct but if i don't you know it's, it's all luxury, good it's a luxury just, problem right it's a luxury problem exactly yeah right i was trying to remember what bruce campbell called it it was something i thought was uh champagne yeah champagne problem and that, <laughs> that's kind of true now, um, I'm going to get back to some questions. I'm not ignoring all these questions that are coming in, but I always have so much. I always, I always have so much fun talking with Joe that I tend to hog the show. So I, I apologize. Do you do you do you see? And this is an obvious question that might take us into some deeper, darker waters. Um, a lot of people, you know, are making a comparison between what's going on with this, you know, highly polarized environment and. Uh, craziness that we're going through politically with 1968 and you know you obviously lived through both eras and we're part of the kind of the counterculture in the, in the late 60s early 70s do you see much of a parallel yeah I think there's a lot of parallel I in some ways I think this is worse because I, I actually think and you know this will probably offend a bunch of people but I've never worried about that much is that I actually think we have a moron in the White House and uh, I believe that we have people that know he's a moron, but it's like the, uh, you know, the the emperor's uh, new clothes, where he doesn't really, he's naked, but nobody's going to say it. Yeah. But they know that this guy is an idiot, but they've invested in it the same way they would a football team or something. Yeah, they may be an idiot, but they're our team. And I think that even back then, with people I disagreed with, because like uh, Johnson, for example, uh, and Nixon, but Johnson was one of the was probably the greatest civil rights president since Lincoln. But on the war end, he was terrible. And then Nixon was just more of terrible. And so you have that whole thing that was building up and boiling. And I think you've got that right now. And I think it's going to depend on how things turn out in the three or four months. And uh, they may not turn out the way one side wants it either way. You know, you don't you don't know. But I do believe we got to have change to get change. And we really need to make a step in that direction. The people I always find the most ridiculous are the guys I'm not going to vote, or this is my my way of voting. I'm going to vote for a third party that's going to get you know thousand votes or something, and or that they're both alike. You know, you can make a decision whether you think they're both alike. I I, I think it's a binary choice. But yeah, it reminds me of the '60s a whole lot because. They just decided that you were one thing if you had long hair like I had, or if you were for civil rights like I was, or if you were against the war like I was. It was all lumped into this one group. And everybody, you know, was supposed to be just alike, act just alike, and I didn't fit any of those bills. And to tell you the truth, I think most people did. And I think that's true now. I think we're driven by, by the thing that's worse now is exactly the things you were talking about is the uh, media, the media coverage, because they've got to have something all the time. And what I call the Twitter warrior, the yeah. got you culture, you know, like, uh, well, you said this, I, I, they, they printed, I printed an article of mine that I wrote the other day and I got response for it. And I knew I was going to get negative and good. Mostly I got good. Uh, Stephen King even said, reprint this. This is great. You know, this is well written or something like that. But then there's other people that were on my feed that I, that I didn't even communicate with. I wouldn't even respond, but they argued for two or three days over you know it's kind of like no you didn't yes you did no i didn't yes you did and, you know i think that's part of it is that you've got this stupid way where people can spend the time and sit at home and and now you've got a virus and everybody's trapped so they're spending a lot more time doing this kind of twitter war with one another. right and, and and people make the mistake of thinking that twitter rep actually represents most people it does it represents a group of people that are dedicated to twitter and not even all of them give a shit about it. that's yeah, yeah, exactly. I think reading some of those comments can just, you start to lose your faith in humanity and then you realize, as you say, these are, a lot of these are probably trolls who are, you know, pushing yeah. some kind of yeah. extreme agenda. 
badly. I, I mean, I, I um, block a number of people that I agree with because I just got tired of them arguing with these other people and it popping up on my feed. I said, I just don't need to see that. It's like trying to sit and watch, you know, the news for 24 hours. I mean, well, um, let's see. I have a question or two from, from the viewers. Yeah, any other any other movies coming up in the works? Well, like I said, uh, yeah, well, yeah, there's several in the works, but the, the thing that when this is all over, I'm hoping they'll pick up on it. But when these things get derailed, you never know. And uh, the projectionist, the one I was supposed to direct, I, I think that one still might happen a little later, obviously. Uh, there are a number of things under option, like Edge of Dark Water. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I, I hope so. And uh, my daughter and I are trying to uh, get some TV stuff going and get some book stuff going, and my son and I. So, you know, we got a lot of ifs, and we got some that are that are at least we got paid for. And, uh, you know, that's the best you can hope for, really, to film and you know what beyond a, that. You know what a fun, a fun short would be? Would be Driving to Geronimo's Grave. If you could pull it off as a, as a short film, that would be that would be a blast. I, I agree. Yeah. Well, you know the script my son did for the projectionist. I think at first I thought I would just do like a thirty-minute film, but he wrote such a good script that we got interest in it, and he's been able to get an option on it. You know, time after time, and uh, every about every six months is what kind of deal we got, and I get an option on the story. So I told him the best thing might happen is they never make it and they just keep paying us. Because <laughs> sometimes that is the best. It, even if I'm supposed to direct it, maybe it's best I never direct it. It might be one of those things where I wish I hadn't. Uh, let's see. There's a, a viewer named Ryan who asks, uh, will there be a part two to Texas Night Riders? I'd love to know what happened after Jubal rides off. Probably not. Uh, you know, I don't even remember Texas Night Riders that well. You know, I wrote it in 15 days, well, less than that. There was a contest that I popped up on Ben, and I said, oh, it's 15 days. So I wrote the book in 11, and that gave me mailing time. And I was a runner-up, and then it turned around and sold to another publisher. And, and Bantam had the contest. I, I, I used to know whoever it was that won it, or at least, you know, asked. But, was, um, that the, was that the was that the Roy Slater or Ray Slater? Or was that Ray a different Slater, book? No. Yeah. No. Night Riders a race later. And it was published in uh, Britain and there's a hardback version of it. Um, I always when I'm in a used bookstore I'll look in the western section just to see if I come across I'll one. I'll find them every now and then. <laughs> yeah, those in the MIA hunters. Yeah. The three I did, yeah. Right. Well let's see here. Yeah, a lot of people are just uh, you know, saying what big fans they are and how much they love your work. I quit now. Uh to everybody, I appreciate it. Yeah. So anyway, um, I really appreciate you taking some time out to, uh, to visit yeah. today. It's it's fun to, you know, I feel fortunate that we're even able to do this right now, you know? Yes. Dude, this, this changes the game a little bit, you know. It, and, you know, in film, that's what they're doing. They're doing their meetings with, with Zoom. Yep. Uh, and I think it's interesting because you're doing meetings for things that you hope will happen in the near future. Right. And it, it, it's funny because this kind of format lends itself to getting into some, you know, some other material that you might not talk about during a, a live event. And I really like that. You know, I think that's fun. Yeah. Maybe. Well, you know, normally I try to avoid politics, but I think in a general way it's kind of hard to me because the fact that we're doing this is political. And it's also um, virus. You know, it's between the virus, it's between the politics of virus. And, you know, I'm glad to stay home, and I'm glad if I have to go out, I wear my mask, you know. Yeah, yeah. I want that. But, I'm just like everybody else, I am looking forward to that day when we can do this again, Patrick, yeah. to, you know, face to face. Because you have a good restaurant not far around the corner. That's right, that's right. Back. And your buddy from uh, Benson can come up, and uh, Mertz. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And, and Casey keeps saying she's going to come, too. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, she came once or twice. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right, Joe. Well, hey, thanks again so much. What, Thank you so much. What, what's next, by the way? I always ask that. What's uh, happened, Leonard? I mean, um, what's that? Uh, no, I've got a, I, I've got a, well, obviously the uh, issue for dinosaurs collection is coming up, but I'm working on a new novel now, ah. and uh, it's uh, called Moon Lake, and uh, it's a, it's a real bear. It's, it's, it's wrestled with me through the floor every day. I try to have to use a step over toe hold on it every morning. 
but I, I think I'm getting there, you know, and I'm, I'm on the last quarter, and I'm actually into the quarter a little way, so I hope to have it finished in a couple months, uh, if all goes well. Is it different from some of your other books? Yes and no. There, the Southern Gothic kind of meets the uh, meets the pulse, you know. And uh, I, I think it's I think it's different, and yet I think obviously there are echoes of my style and the and and the way it feels and all that. But yeah, it's different. I think it, I think it is different. I don't want to talk too much about it because uh, it's not finished, you know. Right. And uh, things can come alive. But right now, it, it looks like I'm getting there. It's been the hardest novel I've ever written since Walls of Shadows. And Walls of Shadows, I, I actually pulled and ended up doing it from Subterranean Press. This one's not like that. It's going well, but it's just very, very hard. Hmm. Wow. We'll see how that turns yeah. out. Yeah. And I'll probably do another one after that before I go. I Probably two or three years before I go back to Happen. Take a little. Unless it's a short story. A little breather. Yeah, I'll take a little breather. I also wrote one Leonard story not long ago that's coming out in the subterranean newsletter from Leonard's point of view. Oh, and cool. it's called Leonard Walks into, walks into a Bar. And that's just the, the title of the story, Leonard Walks into a Bar. And I'm going to try to do a whole book of stories of, from Leonard's point of view. And half doesn't take place in this story. It doesn't appear in the story, really. And uh, I'm going to try to build It's all after the war, when he's home after the war. But I may jump around, but that's kind of something I hope to get done. If, you know, if I have enough time, if I live long enough, if I can put in that next twenty years on all my projects. Does your does your your sense of uh, your sense of history and kind of your attitude towards it have you noticed it change as you've gotten older, in terms of uh, you know the frontier, for instance, these different periods that you write about. Yeah. And you think, you know what, this yeah, really... You know, I always put it in perspective of who they are when, when they were. Right. You know, I, I I do get bothered a little bit when you see, you know, I like the alternate universe thing, but I do get bothered a little bit when you see total rewrites of history to accommodate what we believe now. Right. Because the problem with that, when you do that, that history gets lost. You know, it's... Um, and you say, and, and also there's this whole period, I don't want to be offended. Well, you know, fuck you, you're going to get offended. That's mm. the way it works. Well, I like that. It's just full of all kinds of little bit of discipline. But, you know, I think I think that uh, you do become more aware of things, though, that you might not have thought of in the 50s or 60s uh, and the 70s. And as you get a little older, you have a different perspective on history, and you should. But I also think you, ought, you have to look at, and each section of history, you have to evaluate it for now, but you have to look at it for when it was then and what was going on then so that you don't start cleaning that up to make it look better or pretending it didn't exist because then you, don't, you quit learning. It's like, you know, you suddenly, uh, like Auschwitz never never happened because you don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. It should be uncomfortable. It's one of the, the horrors of the world history, you know, and there are other things like you know, the things that, that have happened to people uh, since the beginning of time. We need to remember the bad things, and we need to celebrate some of the good things a little more than we do. I think. Perfect note to sign off on. Joe, thanks so much, and uh, always good to talk with you. And, uh, yeah, I miss you, Patrick. I, I miss I, you I really too, need, man. Uh, can't wait because when we talk in person, it's, you know, we can we can laugh, and, and then we can say stuff we're not going to say you yeah. know, on the screen. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, Joe, we'll have yeah. a great night. Take care. Yeah, you too. We'll talk Bye. to you soon. Bye-bye.